We read together this morning from the epistle, the letter, the book of James. We begin this morning a series of Sundays going through the epistle. It will take us quite a few weeks because we're going to take it in bite-sized chunks rather than taking too much at once. So we'll probably be finishing James chapter 4 sometime after, sometime after Christmas. That may be an awesome prospect to be doing anything after Christmas at all at this stage in the year. We begin this week by looking at chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. If there's a pew Bible nearby, let me encourage you to take it up and follow the reading with us, and then to, uh, to open it again when we come to the sermon later on. James is very near the end of the whole Bible, and it's perhaps easier to find it by flicking back through the last few pages until you come to James. The Epistle of James, the first chapter and the first twelve verses. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Amen, and may God bless to us the reading of his word. One in the first twelve verses. This letter was written by the person that we know to be Jesus' brother, James. He was writing as a Jew, because remember, of course, Jesus was a Jew, writing as a Jew to Jews who had become Christians. That's what he means when in the very first verse he says, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. That's a kind of key phrase to describe Jews who had been scattered from their homeland, who were living in other parts of the former Greek Empire, living in other parts of the present Roman Empire, living well over to the east, even to the far east. James to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. And it's a circular letter. There is no one congregation in mind. It's a general letter that would have been sent round many different churches, copied, taken from place to place. And it's an intensely practical letter about living the Christian life. James is somebody who wants to help people to know, as it were, where to put their feet in being a Christian. What do I do next? What do I do in this situation? It's a practical letter, and it's also a very realistic letter. The underlying assumption, if you like, that James is making as he writes is that being a Christian is no cop-out, it's no soft option. Being a Christian doesn't give you a magic wand to wave over your own life or anybody else's. There are no quick fixes, no instant cures in being a Christian, as I discovered when the car conked out at the bottom of Windsor Street this last Wednesday. Being a Christian is no soft option. And James launches straight in to his main subject, as it were, that runs throughout the letter, the trials and temptations. Instantly, we are plunged by James into a world that every Christian recognizes. Ah, 
Here's somebody who's actually writing to me and my situation, who understands my problems. We're into a world that every Christian knows because Christ promises no easy road to glory. Look at the one that Christ himself trod. Look at the way that he calls you to follow. No easy road. Sometimes, as the old redemption song says, the road is rough and steep. And in a sense, the Christian's road especially can be rough and steep. Christians will be opposed in their God-honoring progress through life by a tempter. There is somebody who cannot stand the thought of God being honored by the way that we live, by the way that we conduct our business, speak to our friends, behave at home. There is a tempter who hates God being honored by our lives. And a Christian will face temptation and will want to resist that temptation. And so life for the Christian in the first instance is a battle. There is armor to be buckled on, there is warfare to be waged. Neither does the Christian instantly become sin-free when he or she is first, as it were, captured by Christ. Our character, our personality, our attitudes, our reflexes need bit by bit to be purified. Like gold that is freed from its devaluing dross by fire, the Christian will be tried and tested. Life isn't just a battle, life is also for the Christian a crucible. For there is refining to be done. Nor does God accomplish all his work in the believer in one fell swoop, as it were, of a sculptor's chisel. Rough edges take time to smooth off. Those Gritty, sharp bits in our personalities and our characters take time to be rounded. The likeness of Christ may have to be quarried out of our lives by major blasting work. Life is not an art gallery. Life for the Christian is a workshop. It's dusty. There's plenty of rubble around. It's a place of rolled up sleeves and sweat and hard work but it's a place where beauty is created. Trials and temptations. The Christian in a battle, the Christian in a crucible, the Christian in God's workshop. Trials and temptations. God's means by which you and I become more like Christ. And James starts his epistle with this amazing statement, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials and temptations, trials of many kinds. Count it pure joy. And he follows it up in verse 12 with even more, blessed, happy, happy. Happy and fulfilled is a man who perseveres under trial. See, James knows that the trials that face us, the temptations which dog us, James knows that those things are the means by which God will work his glory in our lives. There are things which afflict us, circumstances well beyond our control. There are things within. There are temptations that we respond to. And there are many kinds. There are no distinctions that James is working with here. It may be something minor that hits us, frustrates us, annoys us, tempts us into an anger which is entirely unreasonable, tempts us to say things, think things which we know we ought not to. Might be something major. A huge catastrophe that overtakes us. Right out of the blue. Or some ferocious temptation that grips us in the midst of an ordinary day. James writes to these Christians and he wants them to know that they should rejoice and he wants them to know why. Because God is at work in the midst of them to produce one of the most vital Christian qualities 
that there is perseverance a short while ago we were looking at the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13 and Jesus there talks about one kind of person who hears the word and responds immediately oh this is great, I love this give me more of this, I am so happy this is fantastic, preach me another sermon come on, read me another chapter I can't get enough of this, marvellous and as soon as the heat comes on, as the sun rises then that plant that has grown up so quickly just withers because it has no root there was no persevering strength because the roots had gone down no distance at all James knows he would have listened to that parable James knows that the Christian needs to persevere the Christian needs something of endurance of staying power, of stickability, of consistent progress and he knows that perseverance isn't an end in itself perseverance itself yields the fruit of Christian maturity the well-rounded Christian character if you like the person who has been through the surface of a, the furnace of affliction the person who has had the rough bits hammered off his life the Christian who carries scar tissue from the battle with sin from the battle with circumstances and yet who is still in church on Sundays who is still reading the Bible who is still praying who is still seeking to share Christ with others who is still loving his or her Lord who is still in fact more compassionate more understanding more tolerant more patient made more gracious made more helpful made more winsome made more Christ-like the Christian who is mature the Christian on whom others can depend the Christian that you can rely on not just to turn up to be, but to be the right kind of person to learn perseverance to learn to be that mature complete Christian and it's interesting that that is a concern that James has James is not primarily concerned with passing on to these congregations ace models for church growth that will bring in thousands he is not primarily concerned that these Christians find the key to prosperity he is not primarily concerned that these Christians learn how to have a trouble free wonderful smiles on existence James is far more realistic and James has a far bigger view than God of that James doesn't just believe in a God who is there to give us presents and make us happy a God who is there to start our engines when they conk out a God who is there to provide parking lots for people who can't find them on their own James's God is far far greater than that and James knows that if God is going to do that work in a person's life which produces perseverance if he is going to produce as it were mature Christians then God will also help and he wants these Christians in these churches that he's writing to to know that they can turn to him for help it takes wisdom to resist temptation it takes wisdom to persevere we need wisdom to get through the trials you know that you like more than a drink and that you have a problem saying no to more and more what's the wise thing to do spend Saturday night in a bar or at home with your family you know that you have a problem because somebody at work fancies you regardless or partly because of the wedding ring on your finger and you actually quite like them what is the wise thing to do? go for dinner with them? you see if we are going to resist temptation if we are going to make our way through the trials we need to be wise 
We need that practical savvy that the Bible calls wisdom. We need to know what is right and what is wrong, how to do the right, how to live the best. We need to be able to take the truths of God's word and apply them to our days and to our evenings so that we steer our life aright. And the wisdom that we need is there for the asking. There for the asking. Go ahead, believer, write the check. It's there for the asking. The wisdom to get us through the next 48 hours, the next 30 seconds, the next six months, however long the trial or temptation may last, and come out on the other side further on with Christ. The wisdom is just there for the asking because the God that James believes in, the God that he saw in his cousin Germain, in Jesus is a God who gives generously lavishly without finding fault that's why we sang what a friend we have in Jesus there are some people you maybe know people like this there are some people that you would never go to to ask anything for because all they'll do is tell you how wrong you are for having got yourself in the situation of having to ask for it there are some people that you would never share a need with because you know fine well they'll just drag up the things that you did wrong last Tuesday, three weeks ago, last Wednesday, ten years ago, whatever. There are some people who are gifted at fault finding. And James wants these Christians to know that right in the midst of the trials and the temptations, when the crucible is at its hottest, when maybe they have got themselves into a right old pickle, because of their own folly, because of their own lack of wisdom, they have walked right into a temptation. James wants them to know that they can come to a God who does not find fault, who doesn't say, well, you can get yourself out of this mess because you got yourself into it. And just ask. And he will give them the wisdom to find their way out and the strength and the need what a friend we have in Jesus. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What's your view of God? What you think of God is not for most of us the product of our experiences. Our experiences tend to reinforce what we already think about God. When we walk into a trial, a temptation, when we walk into adversity, what we believe about God will be revealed. What do you think of God? Is He the one that you can approach with even your failures? and ask for help, for wisdom, for courage, for strength. Trials and temptations that can yield so much good fruit in our lives now. Trials that we have God's help just for the asking to endure. Trials that will yield a perseverance that will give for us a crown of life in the hereafter. Trials and tribulations that we persevere through because we love the God who takes us through them. As James says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him why persevere? why go on? you believe in God and life has suddenly got harder for you you have committed yourself to him and suddenly the problems have mushroomed 
Do you love him? If you love him, you will persevere. Persevering is not just a test of our view of God and of our prayer life. Persevering is the test of our love for God. How God grant us the grace to persevere. And we'll see more about the trials and the temptations next week when we look at verses 13 to 18. Amen.